Okay, so while we wait for confirmation of Urbana, uh, quick item. So uh, we're going to have the exam at the end of the month, first exam, okay? And um, uh, it's scheduled on February 27th. Because of the scheduling uh, you know, of the center, so we're going to uh, try to arrange for a three-hour block that everyone can make it. And um, so Charles is going to send everyone a link that um, so you you guys can tell him you know when you can be available so that uh, he can find that three hour block, and um, we're going to arrange for um, at least uh, I'm going to be in Europe so one of the TAs will be on call with questions, so um, you know hopefully everything will work. This is the first time we we do it, so you know what um, let's kind of a just um, um, let's work together to you know to make it into uh, as smooth as possible and um, so hopefully we'll work out all the bugs so uh, you know so let's figure it out okay so that's February 27th and um, uh, we're going to make, make a little bit of a uh, rearrangement of schedule this semester so I'm showing here the class schedule and um, uh, so we're what we're going to do is after I finish the uh, shear memory data reuse analysis for convolution um, we're going to uh, begin to uh, cover um, machine learning and neural net right after that. So that will start on February 15th. And this is a, a, a new schedule. Um, before this, we're, uh, we would be covering the uh, reduction trees in the previous semesters. So, uh, but this will allow us to get you started thinking about your final project earlier. So we're also going to uh, make the base material for the final project available to you earlier this semester, okay? And um, uh, so during, uh, the exam is going to be uh, on February 27th, so uh, the exam will cover everything up to and including lecture 11. So that's going to be the February 20th lecture, okay? And so um, you know, uh, up to that, uh, so we're going to readjust a few things uh, in the uh, videos and material uh, in the next few days so that uh, you know, we'll get everything lined up again in the last few days, okay? So, but uh, the, uh, the big picture should have uh, settled by now and the TAs and, and, uh, are working very hard to make sure that uh, all the mater base materials are ready for you uh, by uh, February, uh, by, uh, you know, uh, by the time that you, you need to uh, submit your milestone uh, end of February early March, okay? So uh, let's go back and uh, work on the tiled convolution computation. So the objective of this lecture is for you to learn tiled convolution algorithms. And um, uh, the convolution that we presented last, uh, on Tuesday was fine, and we also uh, we used the constant memory to essentially eliminate all the global memory accesses, virtually all the uh, global memory accesses with constant caching. Okay, so the uh, the bandwidth of convolution is about memory bandwidth requirement is about half of matrix multiplication because matrix multiplication requires n and n global memory accesses. Here, we use constant memory to eliminate the access to M, but we still need to access N. So that's why we eliminated about half of the global memory accesses. And if you look at the convolution computation, it's still inner product. So it's still a multiplication and addition, right? So the compute to memory access ratio is about two times higher, uh, two times higher than multi matrix multiplication. However, we know from matrix multiplication, we needed to improve the ratio to about 30 times or more rather than just two times more. So that's why even with the constant caching, the um, convolution, base convolution algorithm is still not going to perform very well on uh, GPUs. And so we're going to uh, look at how we can tile the N matrix in convolution so that we can further uh, re, uh, eliminate uh, much of the memory accesses and further improve the ratio. But there are some uh, intricate aspects of tiling for convolution.
the convolution computation is actually quite di different than matrix multiplication because the inner products are much shorter. The inner products are not entire rows and columns. The inner products are between the masks, right? The mask uh, you know, elements and the ML elements. And these convolutions are limited by the size of your convolution mask. So that will uh, reduce some of the reuse that we can achieve, and they also introduce some intricacies when we tile these uh, tile the M matrix. And so there, there is a very important um, you know, the concept, uh, sort of the conceptual difference between the output tile and the input tiles. For matrix multiplication, what we did was that we made the output tile the same as the input tile to make it conceptually a lot easier, right? So when we uh, think about the tile matrix multiplication, we assign the threads to load the input tile elements the same way that they produce the output tile elements, right? And that made everything nice. You know, you can actually have memory correlation working, right? And um, uh, also, just indexing-wise, it make, we made, uh, made it conceptually a lot simpler when we load these, uh, you know, the, the two input tiles. However, for convolution, the um, tiling becomes quite a bit more complicated because we need to worry about the additional elements, the additional elements beyond the core, right? Because we have to have this radius of additional elements uh, from the input when we generate these output elements. So there's three different styles of input tile loading. And these three input, uh, three uh, styles are all valid. And there, some of them, uh, one of them will be more efficient than others depending on the hardware style. So, um, so we're going to introduce all the three styles. And um, I'm going to comment on, you know, on which styles you might want to use. But uh, really, uh, it would be very nice for you to, uh, you know, to implement one of the styles as your primary style. And then maybe try another one just so that you get, you know, uh, you get even more experience with it. We only require you to implement one style, okay? But you can certainly go above and beyond and understand, um, you know, that some of the intricacies better by implementing more than one style. So uh, this should get you prepared for MP4, okay? So um, let's start by talking about the basic concept of, you know, the uh, you know, tiled convolution. So let's start with one dimension. So here we show a very small example of 16 elements. And we're dividing the 16 elements into output elements into four output tiles. So these are the output tiles that we're showing on top of the picture, okay, the output tiles. And in order to generate these output elements, let's say let's take uh, you know, tile one here. We, in order to generate elements four, five, six, seven, we need to have, you know, for a, uh, a uh, five, uh, uh, tile with five or radius two convolution, we will need to have two elements to the left and two elements to the right in order to generate these uh, four elements. So we're going to need to have eight elements of input in order to generate these four elements of output. So these additional elements in the input that we need to use in order to generate the output are called the halo elements. Okay, they're kind of the little halos on the side of each, uh, each side of your uh, core uh, input that need to be loaded somehow. So um, if we uh, partition our input into these input tiles, now we actually we have input tiles that are not exactly exclusive of each other. Now we're beginning to have input tiles that will be overlapping with the uh, other tiles nearby. So we're going to, for this tile one, we're going to need to have two elements of the input that are actually in the core part of tile zero. Okay, so this will eat into our efficiency because we're going to assign thread blocks to compute each of these output, just like matrix multiplication. Okay, that's fine. But in order to, uh, to, uh, to load an input tile, let's say if we want to uh, load all the input elements, 
into the shear memory as an input tile in order to generate an output. These elements are going to be loaded into shear memory, right? It's going to, uh, going to all go into the shear memory. And the shear memory contents of block, thread block one will be different than the shear memory contents of block zero, right? So that means that thread block zero will load all these elements into its shear memory, and thread block one will load all these elements into its shear memory. So elements two, three will be loaded by both thread block zero and thread block one. So this is where the additional overhead will start to happen. Remember, in matrix multiplication, we also have something a little bit similar to this, right? We said that uh, you know each row in M is going to be used by you know multiple columns, but then the number of reuses was limited by the number of columns covered by a thread block, right? And so the elements of that row loaded into the shear memory of will only be used by the threads in that thread block. And there's a neighboring thread block, or the, you know, even far away thread block, that would also use that row, but that they would need to load the elements into shear memory, their own shear memory. So that limited our reuse in matrix of multiplication. Right? Here, we have a slightly different uh, situation, because the inputs needed to calculate the output overlap. So, but the outputs are calculated by you know, different thread blocks. So these neighboring thread blocks will also need to load overlapping input elements into their shared memory so that they can, uh, you know, so that there will be some reduction in terms of the um, memory efficiency that we can achieve. So this is a very, very important aspect of convolution. The fact that these output elements require additional inputs on the side to calculate, and we call them halo elements here, is uh, you know is a very important pattern that we we call the stencil patterns. And these patterns would you know have these you know the the wider your mask it uh, mask is, the more the halo elements you need to have, and the lower the memory access efficiency will be able to achieve with tiling. Okay, so uh, no, so far we have seen two things. One is compared to matrix multiplication, because we can use M, uh, you know, constant memory and constant caching for M, we improve. So the uh, the memory access efficiency is a little bit higher than um, you know matrix multiplication. But on the other hand, because of this behavior of halo access, it, the memory access efficiency tiled, uh, of the tiled convolution will be lower than matrix multiplication. Okay. So these uh, factors kind of work against each other. So that, uh, in the end, the, um, the, the tiling efficiency of um, you know, convolution tend to be just a little bit less than matrix multiplication in general for smaller, you know, uh, for, for bigger uh, masks. And for smaller ma uh, max, uh, uh, masks, they can be somewhat comparable, but um, you know, the, as we will see in the calculation that we're going to do in the next uh, lecture, there's quite a few factors involved, and so you know, uh, I'm not going to oversimplify it at this point. So, when we do tiling, because of the halo cells, we're going to have three strategies, okay? And three strategies, and these three strategies are actually quite universal, and um, whenever we have CPU code. We'll also, uh, you know, you need to use one of these three uh, tiling strategies. And uh, whenever we use, um, you know, uh, OpenMP or MPI, we also need to use one of these three you know, tiling strategies. They just are applied in, you know, different contexts and different, uh, you know, in slightly different forms. So the first strategy is that we're going to have the uh, block size to cover the size of the output. So if we go back to the original picture here, the thread block will be defined in, uh, in terms of the number of output elements. So the, in this little example here, we're going to have four threads in each thread block, and that will cover the four output threads. So since we set the thread block size to be the size of the output, thread, output tile, we're not going to have enough threads 
to load the input elements if we only want each one to load one element. So every thread would need to load more than one element. Okay, so that's you know, the important part of strategy one. Um, we're, so we're going to take three steps to load the input into the, uh, the input tile into the, uh, the shared memory. So we're going to take step one to load the left payloads. And then step two, we're going to load the core. The core is the same size as the output tile, right? So we will have definitely have enough threads to load the core of the input. And then we take the third step for some of the threads to load the right halo, okay? Obviously, the right halo, uh, the left halo and the right halo will not involve all the threads. You know, in, in a, you know, let's say if the radius is two, we only need to have two threads on the left and two threads on the, uh, on the right to load. So uh, we will need to have some kind of test and only have the threads that sh need to participate to load those halo cells. So uh, in the code, we're going to see these three steps. And um, you can generalize it to uh, two-dimensional loading. However, the two-dimensional loading is a little bit more complicated because you have both X and Y halos. So you need to uh, essentially uh, have a way to load all the you know, uh, X, Y halos. So that's uh, you know, actually quite complicated uh, you know, uh, uh, process. So that's why strategy one is usually not a preferred method for GPUs, okay? But strategy one is oftentimes used in other types of hardware. Strategy two is, uh, takes, uh, defines the, um, the thread block to match the input tile size, okay? So we provide enough threads to load all the elements of the input tile. So in this, uh, the previous example, we, have, we had four elements in the output tile and eight elements in the input tile. So we're going to declare our thread block to have eight threads in that example. So we will have enough threads to load all the inputs into you know, the required by the output tile into the shared memory. However, when we calculate the output, the do the, actually calculate the inner products for the output elements, only four of those threads will participate. So we will turn off some of the threads when we calculate the convolution itself. We only will turn on enough threads to generate all the output elements, okay? And so that will be the, uh, you know, uh, the key difference. So uh, we will have some wasted number of threads during the computation step of the, uh, the algorithm. The third strategy is that um, uh, we actually uh, use a kind of a, uh, a compromise. We, up, we declared the thread block to be of the same size as the output tile. So we, st we only will have enough threads to calculate all the output elements. So, but when we load the input, we actually don't bother to load the, uh, you know, the, um, the left halo or the right halo into the shared memory. We only load the core, the core part of the input tile into the shared memory, okay? But we pay the penalty when we actually calculate the inner products. So uh, during the computation of the convolution inner products, we do a test and see if the input elements that we're trying to access during that convolution will, uh, can come from the shear memory or is actually the, one of the halo elements. If it turned out to be one of the halo elements, then we actually go out to the global memory at that point and access the data. So each one has its pros and cons, right? The first, you know, the, the, uh, the first strategy, strategy one, has you know, the, the disadvantage of taking three steps to load the input elements, okay? And uh, when we take those three steps, the first step and the third step of loading will not make good use of all the threads, right? We only will turn on a small portion of the threads for the loading the left halo, and then we'll t the turn on a small portion of the threads to load the right halo in those two steps. So the calculation 
it's going to be very efficient, but the loading process will be inefficient for strategy one. For strategy two, the loading process is going to be very efficient because we have in, you know, the, every threat just to do one step, right? So we have exactly the, the right number of threads to, do, uh, to load the input elements into the shared memory. However, during the computation of the convolution, um, we have too many threads. We have more threads than necessary to calculate the output. So during the computation, we need to turn off some of the threads to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to generate only the necessary you know, output elements. So that will create a little bit of what? Divergence, right, in the, during the computation. And also we will waste some of the threads. Some of the hardware resources will be used but not generate the values. The third strategy is an interesting compromise. We load uh, just the core of the input tile, and uh, we do not use more threads than necessary to calculate the output, right? So in, in that sense, it, it's kind of reached, uh, you know, uh, reaching a very good balance between the two worlds. So you know what, we, we, we use all the threads to load the core of the input, we load, use all the threads to calculate the output. However, the problem is that when we calculate the output, some of the input halos, the halos will not be in the shared memory. So we will need to do the test in the inner product computation to see if some of the inputs need to come from the halo, and then we access the global memory for those elements. So that makes the inner product loop uh, less efficient. So um, in the early days, the, um, you know, uh, when we uh, do the calcul, uh, in the very early days, uh, the, uh, the GPU, the primitive GPUs, uh, we tend to use strategy one because of what we call the alignment uh, problems with coalescing. And then uh, for the uh, younger, uh, for the next few generation of GPUs, the strategy two is a preferred strategy. And um, uh, we actually, you know, uh, have a pretty good, you know, even though uh, we have the, uh, you know, we, still, we need to turn off threads and when we access the memory, we have a, a problem called the you know, memory alignment problem here because the threads are, not, uh, are going to be accessing memory locations that are not multiples of 16 words. So, but because of caching capabilities and alignment, but improvements in alignment, strategy, uh, strategy two becomes the preferred strategy, okay? And with the most recent GPUs, strategy three are actually, is actually becoming um, you know, as good or even in some cases better than strategy two. The reason is uh, in strategy three, even though we think that we're accessing the global memory for the halos, because of the L2 cache, most of those elements are in the cache. So uh, we're actually effectively accessing uh, you know, all those uh, elements from the L2 cache. So the penalty is not that great. And as we will see on Thursday, uh, no, not, uh, next Tuesday, the halos are not reused nearly as much as the core inputs. So the fact that we bother to, to load them into the shared memory is actually not enabling as many reuse as the elements that, uh, that belong in the core part of the input. So the benefit of loading these you know, the halo elements into the shared memory does not buy you as much as you think. And then accessing them from the global memory is mostly going to be served by the L2 cache, so you're not paying as much penalty as you would think when you uh, uh, use strategy three. So that's why for the most recent GPUs, the uh, strategy three tend to be, uh, you know, uh, become the preferred strategy. Most students in uh, 408 uh, tend to uh, use strategy two in the past. A few of them use strategy three. So we give you the, the freedom to choose whatever you want. But uh, you know, if the code is actually not hugely different. You need to move the testing from, out, you know, from the loading to the calculation part. But I think you would you know, uh, really enjoy that experience and then uh, you know, observe some differences. Um, uh, we're using. Uh, in fact, uh, I think we're using a, uh, an older GPU in the, uh, in the uh, Amazon cloud. 
So I don't think uh, you know, strategy three will necessarily outperform strategy two, but um, you know, just keep that in mind. These things are hardware dependent. So this is an opportunity for me to give you a kind of a, a, a first round of uh, you know, insight into why you know, when, we, you know, when the strategies, the preferred strategies oftentimes change as the hardware progress. Okay, when we have newer generation of hardware, because of some of the hardware improvements and so on, oftentimes you know, people will tell you, oh, the code that I wrote a, a couple years ago now is no longer up to date. And the reason why you know, some of these things need to update it is precisely because of the, the, the reasoning that I just gave you. you know, the, in, given certain hardware arrangement, you may have a preferred strategy, but as the hardware begin to change, you know, some of these fact considerations and factors start to shift, so you may need to you know, the, uh, adapt your hardware. That's the reason why every time companies like Intel, NVIDIA, or um, you know, AMD, IBM, when they release new chips, you know, they need to go through a very fairly extensive review of their library code. Their library code would uh, tend to have to be you know, made much, uh, uh, part of your li that their libraries oftentimes need to be rewritten or improved or revised because of the hardware changes. So some of the performance, otherwise they would not be able to achieve uh, you know, their intended performance improvement when, when they release the new hardware, okay? So let's look at strategy one, okay? Strategy one is you know, conceptually fairly straightforward, right? So you know what, um, uh, we want to calculate one of the output tiles and then we, we identify the corresponding uh, core L, uh, area in the input, and then uh, we have the left halo and the, le uh, the right halo. So the way that we should think about this is actually, you know, conceptually it will become a lot easier if you think about it as loading three tiles. Okay? We load the core tile, we load the left tile, and we load the right tile in, uh, in, the, uh, you know, the, uh, in the input. However, when we load the uh, the left tile, we only enable the loading of the end of that, le that left tile so that uh, we get the halos. And then when we load the right tile, we only enable the first few elements that correspond to the halo so that uh, you know, we, uh, we only you know, load those uh, halo cells also. So this is exactly what we do, uh, we do here. We, calcul we uh, calculate the radius. So in this case, it's the mask width of two, uh, divided by two. So for a five width, you know, the mask width, we will have two on each side. The radius will be two in this example. So n equal to uh, radius equal to two here. And then, so uh, we can start to calculate the uh, halo index left and the halo index right. So this, is, this calculation takes the block index and subtract by one. Okay, subtract by one and multiply by the block dim dot x. What are we doing? We're taking, you know, remember all thread zero, thread one, thread two, thread three will be mapped into these four elements here, right? So by subtracting their block index by, uh, by one, we're mapping these threads to the left four elements. We're really shifting the index to one block to the left. So we're mapping the same threads to the elements to the left, just by shifting everyone to the left by four in this example, okay? And then we're going to test uh, whether the uh, thread ID x dot x is greater than uh, block dim x minus radius, because we only want to have the threads whose thread ID is big enough to be at the end, okay? At the end of this thread block, or map to the end of the uh, previous input tile, core input tile, to load these two elements into the, uh, right, uh, in, uh, into the shared memory. So we test whether the thread index is big enough to be loading those halo cells. And if so, then we, take the, uh, we use the left index to load from n. But if it's too big, okay, if it's, you know, if it's not big enough, then we just put zero, okay, zero into the, um, you know, into the, uh, uh, the shared memory. And then uh, we load that 
element into the uh, you know into the, uh, uh, the the shear memory. So remember, we still need to do the uh, ghost cell test because we could be loading our L, uh, in, input tile for output tile zero. When the, we are at the at, uh, edge of the output, our input is going to be, load, uh, be loaded from the ghost cells. So we still need to make sure that we test whether the halo index left is less than zero. If it's less than zero, remember our, our uh, policy is to load zero into the shared memory. Yes? Um, okay, uh, let me make sure. I, uh, I, uh, so what you're asking is, how are we really shifting the index when we load into the shared memory, right? So you, when we load into the shared memory, we're not load shifting everyone to the, to, to the left by two. You're absolutely right. We're shifting everyone to the left by the entire tile size, uh, core, uh, uh, block size. Yes, okay, so what, why not just shift the index to the left by the radius amount, yeah. right? So uh, this has to do with uh, alignment. So if we shift everything to the left by two, in some of the hardware, we'll, the thread zero will be starting to access, uh, will be accessing element two, uh, thread one will be accessing element three, right? And then thread three will be accessing element four. However, in most of the uh, hardware that uh, um, you know, you, there is what we call the memory alignment, and if if thread zero, if the same thread block access elements that are not in the same 16 word chunk in the address space, if you divide up the address space into these 16 word chunks, if if the access goes across these boundaries, in a lot of the hardware is less efficient. So that's why. You know, what, the, what we do is we actually you know, shift all the threads, uh, threads to the left by, the, uh, you know, by at least 16, or multiples of 16 in this case. And then we enable the larger thread indices to access 2 and 3. And then when we move into the core, we will be accessing 4, 5, 6, 7, and that's totally aligned. And then we uh, move to uh, one more t step to the right, and thread zero and thread one will be accessing eight and nine. If there's no alignment problem, then you're right. Because if there's no alignment problem, by shifting everything just by two to the left, you will be able to only take two steps rather than three steps when you load a halo. In fact, you should try that. And you know that it, in the most recent hardware, you may actually get a little bit better performance because they had more hardware to smooth out some of the alignment penalties, okay? So great question. And uh, in general, when we uh, load into the, uh, you know, in, uh, load the, the input tiles for convolution, we see the important pattern. We see the input, uh, important pattern that inside the tile loading, we need to take care of the halos, uh, the ghost cells. Okay, we need to make sure that we take, take care of the ghost cells. And this index has to be less, uh, greater than or equal to zero on the left, and it has to be less than, or, uh, you know, less than the length on the right in order for us to, you know, to only load the valid you know, uh, input elements. And we, you know, if, according to our policy, we use zero here for you know, the, ele uh, the ghost elements on the left or on the right. Now, the, the second step is very simple, because we know that the core of the input tile, in this case, the four, five, six, seven, uh, you know, we you know, definitely have exactly the, the, the right number of threads for loading those uh, you know, uh, core input elements. So we just use uh, n, uh, we just generate the block index, but block idx dot x times block dim dot x plus thread idx dot x. What does this mean? This means that we're just Taking the block index and um, uh, times the block dim, so we are we're really moving the index space into the beginning of the uh, of the uh, the input, and then we use the thread index 
to access each of these you know, elements within that section, right? So the first one moves the thread into the right beginning of the section, and then we use the thread index to, in, to, to, to choose the right element in the section. So this is really the same pattern that we had in you know, a matrix multiplication and so on. And then, uh, so we, we would add, we would load the elements into the shared memory. So uh, the way that we load into the shared memory is we want to use the thread ID in the, uh, IDX to, to select the shared memory uh, array location. But remember, we already have the radius number of elements of halo, right? The halo that we already loaded in the, in the first uh, step. So we need to add radius to these indices to make room for those two uh, elements that were already loaded. So 2, 3 will end up in NDS 0 and 1. And then 4, 5, 6, 7 will end up in uh, NDS locations 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? And then um, we're going to load the right halo. So the right halo is very similar to the left halo, except that we're using the smaller threads. So we plus we add one to the block index, right? So we add one to the block index to map all the threads to the next section, to the next section. And then uh, we use the uh, thread index to select one of the, uh, the elements. And we test whether the thread index is less than radius, because only the thread index less than, uh, threads with index less than radius should load the first few elements in that halo. So if that's the case, we go ahead and load. But remember, we're loading the right halo now. So if we were working in the, um, in the last tile, then we will be ac potentially accessing ghost cells on the right. So that's why we need to test whether the halo index right is greater than or equal to the width. If that's the case, then we need to use zero. But if it's not the case, then we go ahead and load the n. So this is a complete, you know, the, uh, 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 sort of uh, the complete uh, collection of the three steps that we will need in order to uh, to load uh, the one-dimensional input tile into the shared memory. Okay? Yes. Because by design, remember, the core, uh, the core tile is the same size as the upper tile. Uh -huh. And when we uh, you know, launched the kernel, we were using the thread block size the same, si as, uh, the, the same as the upper tile size. So we know we have exactly the same number of threads as the number of core input tile elements as well. But if there, it's not an even multiple of the block size. Right. That would be a problem. So that's why when you l launch, for this kind of strategy, when you launch the thread blocks, when you launch the kernel, you need to make sure that the block size is the same as the, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the block size is the same as the output tile size, and therefore the same as the core input tile size. It is possible, that's a, uh, uh, but by the way, it's, it's a very good question. It is possible that the n is not of multiple. Right of the tile uh, of the uh, the output tile size or the block size, but remember we're doing that width test, right? When we load the tile, so the width test will actually get us that that particular one. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, that, that's, uh, the question is, um, instead of doing this kind of loading, is it possible that uh, we can do a, you know, maintain some kind of circular buffer? I think that's what you're, that you're, you're referring to. And then uh, we keep loading the input into the shared memory and keep reusing. Um, you know, in fact, uh, that's the, the basis of the highest performance <laughs> implementation. So uh, in the highest performance implementation, uh, we don't use every thread to only generate one output element. We actually you know, have a bigger output tile, and uh, we use you know, a smaller tile size, but assign each thread to cal calculate multiple output elements. In some of these implementations, what we do is we keep loading things into the shared memory, and we keep uh, using a, a circular buffer to, to maintain the right section 
of the input tile with the halo, with the core, and so on. But we just keep moving the window and calculate the, the next section of the output, the next section of the output. And that will improve the efficiency. So that's actually the basis of probably the, uh, the, the most advanced convolution algorithms. OK? Very good. And uh, by the way, thinking about your question, um, you, I think you're right. If the input may not be multiple of n, if, you, if we don't assume the input is a multiple of the, uh, the tile size, then I think we will need to actually do a test here. And you know, now that I thought about it a little bit, I think you're, uh, you're, you're definitely correct. So uh, you know, do a test. And you know what? I think you will need to t say test whether the, uh, the 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 index, the block idx the times uh, block idx times uh, block uh, dim dot x plus the thread index. This this whole index is within the valid range. If it's not within the valid range, then uh, we will need to you know essentially load zero uh, into the into the uh, shared memory. Very good. Okay, so. Uh, that was the first strategy, okay? And we can put it all together. So this is a kernel, a one-dimensional convolution, tiled convolution kernel, that we took all those steps, you know, we put all the uh, steps together, and, um, uh, you know, we, we can uh, write this kernel. So we start by calculating the radius, and we, uh, we declare the, uh, the shear memory to be tile size plus uh, the mask was minus one because we also need to uh, you know, accommodate the halo cells on both sides. And then uh, we, we see the first step for loading the left halo, and then we load the middle, and we load the right halo, and we do a sync threads. Okay, so don't forget the sync threads. <laughs> Why do we need, still need to, uh, need to have the sync threads? Any volunteers? Why do we need uh, this? threads. Remember, all the threads are going to be using the shear memory, right? Using the shear memory contents for their convolution calculation. So before any thread can use the contents, we need to make sure that everyone has done its job, loading all the uh, you know, input elements into the shear memory, right? So before anyone can start to consume the shear memory. And then, uh, you know, we do the sync threads, and then, uh, you know, what uh, we do the calculation, and the calculation will be accessing the uh, shear memory. And the, uh, the mask is still going to be just NJ because we're already using the constant cache. But um, for the uh, shear memory, uh, we're going to be just using the thread index.x. The thread index.x maps the, uh, you know, the, to, the, uh, to the output thread and the uh, output element. And uh, so essentially, the, uh, we, uh, we will, be, uh, will be using the, uh, you know, uh, the J element to, you know, uh, to iterate through the shear memory and the mask array and do the uh, dot product. So this is the first strategy. Okay? And um, we, we should take a quick look at the kind of data reuse that we can enable for shear memory. If we look at the, uh, the input tile for elements four, five, six, seven, we're going to have two um, halos on the left and two halos on the, on the right. So if we look at the usage of these elements in the shared memory, you know, so when the threads are do all doing uh, you know, the uh, convolution calculation, element two here, okay, the element two in the shared memory will be only used by thread four. Because thread five and beyond, thread five will be using three, four, five, six, seven. Right? And, uh, and then uh, thread six will be using four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? So element zero is only used by calculation of one output element, element four. Okay? And so, so that you know, that's only going to be used once. Element three is used a little bit more. Element three is used by the, cal for the calculation of element four and element five. 
right? Element four used two, three, four, five, six, and element five uses three, four, five, six, seven. So element three will be used in the calculation of two elements. And then element four, once you get into the core of the input tile, element four is going to be used three times. Okay, it's going to be used by the calculation of you know uh, so that's four, five, six. Okay. So uh, you know, the uh, seven will not be using element four. And element five is going to be used four times. And element six is going to be used four times. And then you, you start to decrease again. Element seven is only going to be used three times. And then eight is going to be used two times. And seven is used only one time. So this is the harsh reality of convolution data reuse. The halo cells and the edge cells of the, your input tiles are not used as much as the real core, okay, as the real center of your tile. So this is the fundamental reason why strategy three was developed, right? Because the you know loading these elements still takes memory access, but then you know loading these elements are not paying off as much as loading the core elements, okay? So that's why after we have enough caching, we start to you know to, to uh, prefer to have the uh, you know the uh, uh, strategy three where we don't load these in, uh, input elements, the halo elements into into the shear memory with those steps. Now, let's take a look at uh, strategy two. Okay, so we, we we went over strategy one, and we're uh, you know so let's take take a look at uh, strategy two. In strategy two, remember we we're going to have declared the thread block size to the input tile size, not the output tile size. So we you know we, we have provided every thread block additional threads. So uh, so here we know that uh, we have you know enough threads to load all the uh, inputs you know uh, in the uh, input tile into the shared memory. So here. We calculate a uh, i, which is the block index, the, 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 uh, our, you know, our familiar block idx times block dim.x times thread idx.x. And then we still declare the, uh, the shear memory to be the, uh, you know, the, uh, the tile width. And this tile width is going to be the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the input uh, tile width. So we, we know that we have enough input uh, threads to load all the input, so we just assign every i to load the in, uh, into the shared memory. And again, if we assume that uh, we will uh, process arbitrary length, we will need to do that test. So uh, we will need to add the test to see if the i is within the width of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, the entire input. So then we still need to do a sync thread. Okay, we still need to do that sync thread to make sure that every thread has done its job, and then we can start to do the, the calculation. So the calc so you can see that the input loading is much simpler, right? Um, the input loading now does not require those three steps anymore, right? So all the threads come together, all of them load the uh, the input, whether it's you know uh, halo or whether it's you know non-halo. So um, then, w when we get into the calculation of the um, of the uh, convolution, we start to see a little bit of complexity, because the complexity is that we have an input tile and we have an output tile. So we need to actually have a uh, input tile index and output tile index that are different, and this creates the uh, complexity. So uh, I'm going to go into uh, you know, go into this a little bit here. Okay, so um, we're going to uh, have the you know this tile starting point, which is the block index times the block dim. So uh, this gives us the uh, you know the the beginning point of the tile input tile that uh, you know that we're we're using, and then the next tile starting point is essentially we move we map all the threads. To the next uh, you know, input tile, and then we you know we uh, we have block index index plus one times the block dim, and then uh, so 
Uh, so this, these are the, the output tile you know, calculations. And then we, uh, we map that into the starting point of the input tile. Because remember, in order to calculate any output element, we need to start with an input element that is radius away. Okay? It radius before that output element. So we're going to have an end starting point, which is the output index minus the radius. Now, uh, we can start do, uh, doing uh, start the uh, convolution process uh, and calculate that uh, inner product. So we're going to iterate through all the mask elements. Okay, we're still going to iterate through all the mask elements, and then uh, you know we we'll, we'll, we'll generate a n index for the iteration. The iteration is uh, index for that iteration is the starting point plus the j value. So you know, for each iteration, we're going to increment that j, right? So it will take us to the next n, n element with the n index, and j itself will give us the index into the mask, right? So then, so we expect to see, you know, exactly this. We're going to take um, the n in. So if the n index is greater than or equal to zero, and the n index is less than width, that means that we're within the valid range. And then, uh, you know what, uh, we're going to see, ooh, actually this is the output. This is actually strategy three. So, um, oh, this is actually strategy three. So um, we're going to you know, the, uh, take, uh, when, the, when we access the data, we're going to see if the, uh, the in index is within the core of the, uh, uh, the tile. If it's within the core of the tile, then we just go ahead and access the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the shared memory. But if it is outside the core of the tile, we're actually going to go to the global memory and access the global memory. So this is actually a strategy three code. Okay, I'm going to make that correction uh, after the, uh, the lecture. So this illustrates that when we have the strategy three and we only declare enough threads to uh, access the core part of the input, it makes the loading simpler. But whenever, when we calculate the convolution, we will need to do all these test st steps to make sure that we are, you know, we know where, whether we're accessing the core part of the tile, input tile or the halo part of the uh, input tile. And if it's a halo part of the input tile, we're going to access the global memory location for it. And that global memory location hopefully will be cached in the second level cache. Then they will not uh, you know, uh, cause too much of the memory bandwidth consumption. Okay? So that's 1D uh, the convolution. And we showed detailed code for strategy one and strategy three. And you should be able to, you know, to construct strategy two code because the strategy co two code will look similar to this, to strategy three here, because uh, you know uh, we're declaring the number of threads to be the same as the input tile size, but then uh, we here we will access everything from the shared memory for strategy two, but we're going to turn off some of the threads because we will have too many threads, right, for strategy two. Okay, so that will be a good exercise for you. Now let's move on to 2D. Okay, now that we, you know, what hopefully, you know, uh, the, all the basic concepts and sort of the, uh, you know, the code that you need to write for convolution is uh, pretty clear as far as a 1D convolution is concerned. But um, uh, your MP4 is going to be 2D convolution. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of the complexities that uh, you need to be able to, you know, to, to uh, address uh, doing 2D convolution. Okay, so um, remember, in one D convolution, we have this slight complication of output tiling and input tiling, right? The uh, the fact that the uh, input tiles are you know wider than the output tile, and also you know they, it extends uh, you know by radius on each side, you know gives us a little bit of complexity, uh, you know, in terms of the loading of tiles or the calculation, um, you know, depending on the strategies we take. So uh, we have exactly the same problem for 2D convolution. So we essentially will have a surrounding, you know, this, uh, uh, some surrounding halos. 
in the uh, you know in the uh, in the two D case rather than just on one on each side or uh, you know the, a, a number of elements on each side. So we're still going to do the output tile uh, you know the division. So here we show the output uh, you know tiles, and then we're going to be uh, using the uh, the thread index uh, assign the thread index according to the output tile. So. Uh, you know, so uh, we're going to uh, essentially uh, be assigning. Uh, we can assign the output uh, that index by multiplying the thread uh, block index by the tile size times uh, plus the thread index. So as long as we use the output tile size, we will be assigning one thread to every output uh, element. Now. We can actually use strategy two in 2D. So this is where you know I'm going to walk you through you know the 2D code. So um, you, you can extend this into either strategy one or strategy three. So you know I don't need to repeat everything uh, you know uh, you know for strat uh, for 2D, but uh, you know showing one of them. And it turns out that strategy two is actually conceptually the most you know challenging one. Uh, when it comes to 2D implementation, okay, or 3D implementation. So let's say um, we want to load a tile n into the shared memory, and then uh, you know we want to have all the uh, threads to participate in the loading, and the subset of threads will use uh, the n elements in the shared memory. Remember, in strategy two, we would uh, we would define the thread blocks to have enough threads for loading the entire input tile, right? And then we will turn off some of the threads when we calculate uh, the output. So, uh, so you know what? Uh, we're going to have the essentially the uh, you know the, uh, uh, the for for every uh, tile we're going to have tile width on each side, and then for the calculation of each element we're going to have mass width on each side for the calculation. So this brings us into the kind of the input tile and output tile alignment uh, problem. So essentially, in order to calculate an output tile in the 2D case, we will need to have a input tile that has radius elements um, you know, all around. Right? So you know, for calculating the three element here, we're going to have to have two elements on top and then two additional elements on the side in order to calculate this. So essentially, for calculating uh, element three here, we only will have nine out of the 25 that we need in order to calculate that value, right? So, so we will need to deal with this, you know, uh, um, all these ghost cells and output. Uh, this is actually just a tile, so all these halo cells that uh, we will need to load into the shared memory. So these will need to be loaded from the global memory into the shared memory, okay? So we will, uh, you know, set the, uh, you know, the block dimension to be the output. So the tile width is the output tile width, and so we're going to be, uh, you know, assuming for the uh, MP3, you can assume that we all, we're going to be using a five by five mask. Okay, this makes things a little bit simpler for you, and um, uh, you can certainly try to write a more general code that would work for any arbitrary one, uh, you know, uh, width. So basically, we will declare the uh, the block dimension to be the output tile width plus four. Four is the, you know, the, uh, the width minus one. So essentially to accommodate uh, you know, the, uh, all the uh, input tiles, the uh, two additional halos on uh, both dimensions. So we will, for a, let's say, for, um, if we have a, a small example of four by four output tile, here we will be declaring a eight by eight thread block. And now you can see for small tiles, if we use small tiles, and the convolution will end up loading a whole lot more content into the shared memory. Because 4 by 4 is 16, right? And then if we load an 8 by 8 input tile, 8 by 8 is 64. So the input tile is what? Four times bigger than the output tile. Okay? And this is the, the reason why when we have these tiled algorithms, we want to have reasonably sized tiles. 
if the tile sizes are too small, the halos will begin to become extremely significant part of, the, uh, of these tiles. And loading 64 elements in order to calculate 16 elements is not a great idea. Okay? So, you know, so we read, um, on the other hand, in order to support reasonably big uh, you know, tile sizes, we need to have reasonably big shear memory. So that's why the shear memory size has been steadily increasing over uh, time. You know, it started with about 16 gig, uh, you know, kilobytes, and now it's you know, 64 kilobytes, because people wanted to have more, uh, you know, bigger and bigger shear memory to be able to have big enough uh, tile sizes to be able to uh, overcome these inefficiencies introduced by the halo cells. So in general, the block width should be tile width plus mask width minus one. So what you, uh, and then uh, you, know, you, uh, you can be clear, the, uh, you, you, you can uh, launch the grid by uh, you know, dividing the, uh, the uh, sort of the, uh, the width by the uh, tile width and so on. Okay, so the, this gives you the you know, sort of the, uh, the kernel launch. And then you can use the thread block that matches the input uh, tile size. So each thread loads one element of the input tile, and some threads will not participate in the calculation of the output. So this gives us the most important part of your MP4. If you use strategy two, if you use strategy two, you have to shift your output coordinates into your input coordinates so, so that you can access the input correctly. Okay? So the way to think about it is this. All the threads will be mapped into all the inputs. So the, the, the bigger tile is the input tile. And thread 0 will be accessing the corner. And thread 1 and thread 2 and so on. So that we will just be mapping all the threads into the input for loading input. right? And also, we're going to be using a subset of the threads to calculate the output. So thread 0 is going to be calculating the corner of the output. So conceptually, we're using the thread 0 to load the corner of the input and calculate the corner of the output, which is fine. But in reality, the output element and the input, uh, and the input tile corner are not the same. The input tile corner is going to be here, and the output tile corner is going to be here. So the same thread is going to be calculating a corner output, but it's going to be loading a corner input. So when we calculate the outputs, we're going to turn off the threads that are, uh, you know, be, uh, that that will go beyond the output tile. So that's where, you know, we're, we're going to be using the smaller thread indices to do the calculation, and we're going to turn off the threads with bigger indices, so that uh, you know, that essentially they will be calculating the output conceptually like this. Okay, so that's why. You know, this picture, once you start to write code and start to think about code, this picture is going to be important. This picture gives you kind of the, the, uh, the, the mental uh, invariance in terms of how the threads are mapped into the output calculation, and also threads are mapped into the loading of the input tiles. Okay. All this complexity comes from the fact that we needed to have more elements in the input tile. Okay. So, so how do we shift from the output coordinates to the input coordinates? So uh, you know, so we can uh, start with the uh, thread index and the, you know, thre the x and y, and then uh, we calculate the output first. We calculate the output by multiplying the block index dot x times the tile width. So every thread block is still going to cover only the output tile size, you know, uh, element for the generating the output. So the block index will be multiplied by the tile width, and this is the output tile width. Okay. So this gives us the assignment of the threads to the row and column for generating output. Okay. And thread zero of the, uh, each thread block is going to be calculating the corner of the output tile assigned to that thread block. When, when we load input, we'll calculate an input row index and input column index. And that's just taking every thread's output thread, uh, in, uh, output data index and subtract by the radius. 
this 2 is the radius. Okay. So you can just do the subtraction, and then that gives you the input loading index. Um, so we can still have situations where the, you know, the, uh, some of the threads, when they try to load the input uh, element, they will be loading from the uh, outside, from the uh, halos, from, turn out to be ghosts. So in this case, the halos are fine. The, you know, we'll be accessing inside the, uh, the M matrix. But here, the halos will be coming from outside, and there will be ghost elements. So th that's why when we load the input, even though uh, you know, we, uh, we are going to, you know, the, uh, we're going to be loading, you know, have every thread to load a single input element, we need to test whether the uh, row index and the column index for loading i are within 0 and the height, or the, the 0 of and the width. So we do all these four tests and make sure that the input element that the thread is trying to load is not part of the ghost element. If it's, uh, it's not a part of the ghost element, we can use the row index and column index and linearize it, linearize it, and then uh, access the, the global element, okay, the, uh, the, uh, the global memory. And we can load, uh, we will be loading that into the shear memory using the thread indices. However, if the index, you know, if row, the row input or column uh, you know, uh, input index are, in either one of them is outside, or both of them are outside, then you will be loading zero into your, your uh, assigned shared memory. So this gives us the strategy two code where all the threads are loading inputs, okay? And because the thread block size is designed to be able to cover all the input tile elements, but then we use, we calculate the, in, the input index row and input index column and we do the testing to make sure that if we end up loading any of the ghost cells, we use zero. Otherwise, we use the linearized index to calculate, uh, to access the global memory. So once we, uh, you know, we loaded the elements, but well, we still need to do that sync thread. Okay, don't forget the sync threads. Every semester, we'll have a few students who forget about sync threads, and then they will spend hours and hours debugging their code. So you know, we, we, we'll keep reminding everyone you need to have those uh, the, the sync thread after you load into the shared memory. And then uh, you know, uh, when we go into the calculation of the convolution, we need to uh, you know only use a subset of the, th the threads. So we make sure that only the threads whose X and Y are both less than the tile width. That means that you know we have a subset of the output tile size threads to do the uh, you know, convolution calculation, and so we use the two-dimensional uh, mass, uh, the two-dimensional uh, 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 loop to, calc uh, to, uh, to calculate the two-dimension mask, uh, you know, convolution. So we use IJ here. And then uh, for the shear memory, we use i plus uh, i and j plus the y index and the thread index to um, to access the correct um, you know element for the uh, you know for for uh, for the from the input shear memory. Okay. So finally, you know once every, uh, we're you know we're done with the uh, you know the uh, doubly nested loop, then uh, the only a subset of the threads should be writing to the output, right? Because we have more threads than necessary for the output. So we need to, uh, again, test whether the row output is less than height or the column <coughs> output index is less than the width. And then uh, if so, then we linearize the output index and write the, uh, our result into the uh, p element. So that, that's it. Alternatively, you can extend the YD, uh, 1D strategy 3, okay, in, uh, in, uh, tile convolution into a 2D strategy 3 tile convolution, okay. And um, so each input tile will match the, uh, the corresponding output tile, and then all the halo elements will be loaded from global memory, 
and that con you know so the if con there will be if condition and divergence during the inner product calculation rather than uh, during uh, you know, uh, uh, rather than during the uh, you know the uh, the output uh, calculation so uh, turning off the threads during the computation so if you look at these strategies going back to the code even though we use uh, strategy you know two here we still need to you know turn off some of the threads whereas you know if we use the uh, strategy three we don't turn off the threads but we will need to test whether these accesses are in the core or in the uh, halo so we will see if and else in the inner the more inner loop so the the testing cost will be a little bit higher okay for the uh, strategy three so that brings us to the uh, end of the uh, code so uh, what we did was that we started by uh, looking at the uh, you know, 1d and you know let me emphasize one more time okay the complexity of convolution comes from these halo cells okay the halo cells from uh, you know to either surrounding the 2d or on each side of the 1d and um, if you think about 3d and uh, the halo cells are essentially a surface, right? Surround, uh, you know, surround that cube. And um, uh, the effect of the third, uh, halo cell can be significant if you have small tile sizes. If your output tile sizes are small, your halo overhead will be very significant. As I showed, if you have four, you know, in a one-dimensional case, if you have four uh, elements in the in the output tile, and you have a you know uh, 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 a five by uh, a five mask, then you have two on each side. So you, you will double the size from four to eight for the one D. But if you go to two D, you have four by four in your tile, and then you have eight by eight, you know, with the halos. Then you start. You have four times, okay, four times the output, uh, the input, then output. You have you will have four, four by four, 16 in your uh, output tile, but then you have eight by eight, 64 in the input. When this goes to three dimensions, this becomes even more problematic because in a three dimensional tile, let's say if you have a four by four by four, you get uh, you know, 64, but then eight by eight by eight, you get 200 and, you know, uh, is that the, uh, um, Eight by eight is sixty-four, and another one is five hundred and twelve. Right, so the the ratio actually becomes bigger and bigger as you go into high dimensions. And um, uh, so when we go into tensor, for example, four dimensions and so on, and then it becomes even more a problem. Okay, so that's why uh, all these tiling algorithms that we see, we really strive to uh, to use bigger um, output tiles so that we can reduce the overhead. Whether they're MPI code, whether they're you know, um, uh, share, uh, sort of the uh, uh, open MP code. So uh, in, in the modern uh, computation, uh, remember you know, uh, when we are doing, uh, when we have these you know, uh, big clusters, um, you know, one of the problems that we currently have is that uh, we're, we're having uh, less and less memory available for each core of our processor. And that usually has to do with the, um, the size of the tile we can accommodate uh, with each core of the, uh, in these systems. That's why the core problem is this output tile, input tile you know, uh, ratio. When you have small amount of memory available to each core, you will be forced to use smaller output uh, tile sizes. And then all these halos become uh, you know, uh, significant. So I'm not going to let you go early. I'm going to use five minutes today. We already set it up so that uh, we can begin the analysis part a little bit earlier because you would, uh, we will need that a little bit more time uh, next time. Okay. So uh, let's, you know, uh, just kind of push forward. Before that, do we have any questions about the three strategies? Okay. And then 1D and generalization into 2D, right? And you know what? So you, the, um, you're picking the code that uh, you're going to uh, write for 2D uh, convolution. You know, picking one of the strategies. Okay. So uh, once we write the code, uh, we're going to uh, also need to analyze our code and understand, you know, how fast.
the code, uh, you know, the, this code is going to run. And remember, um, we did a fairly good analysis on the matrix multiplication code. The matrix multiplication code is relatively simple. And um, you know what? We can calculate the data reuse. The data reuse is actually the, uh, the, 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 uh, the power width, right? So it was fairly straightforward. And um, the convolution analysis turned out to be a little bit more challenging. And depending on your perspective, okay, depending on the, 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 the perspective that you use for, you, uh, for calculating your reuse, it can be a lot more complicated or a lot simpler when you uh, do the analysis. So we're going to you know, learn to, you know, the, how we can do the analysis on these tau algorithms. So let's go back to the uh, small 1D example. Okay? The, so um, let's say uh, we use an output house width of 8, right? but we still use mass width of 5. We used to have 4. Now, you know, just for you, uh, to make things more interesting, I'm make, going to make the output house size a little bit bigger. Let's say 8. But then we still have two halo cells on each side because the width is five, the mask width is five. So the output tile has eight elements, and then the uh, input tile in this case will have eight plus four, 12 elements. So as you can see, when we increase the output tile size, the ratio of, uh, you know, the sort of the, over, the relative overhead of these halos become less significant, right? So, you know, it becomes, the, the ratio of these two sizes will be, uh, be, uh, will be closer to one. So the output input tiles for, uh, for block one look like this. And um, so each uh, block will uh, need to load uh, you know, uh, 12 elements in order to calculate eight elements right, in the, uh, you know, in, during the computation. So this is what we uh, just talked about uh, you know, using that small example. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to uh, turn the perspective around. In the previous, you know, uh, lecture, what I did was I point to one of the input elements. Right? I started with this input element and say only one of the output elements will use this input element. Right? And then I point to the, the, the next input element. I say, okay, now there are two elements whose calculation will use this input element, and then three, right? That's how, what I did. But here, I turn things around. I say, for when I calculate this output element, I will need to use these five input elements, right? Eight, I would use six through um, 10. So I'm, I'm using the output calculation perspective. Every output will need to use five input elements. So these are the five input elements that we need to use for every output element, right? So that's, this is just the other perspective. So basically, if we access everything from the global memory, everything from the global memory, we will, be, we will need to, uh, to, to calculate these eight elements, and every, eight el uh, every element will need to access global memory five times, right, for, their in uh, for its input. So if we act, uh, load everything from the global memory, we will need to do A times 5 N uh, elements uh, uh, use you know, to, for the output. Uh, uh, so we, uh, we will need to have 40 N elements for calculating these eight elements, right? So there will be 40 global memory accesses. And if we want to calculate the memory, the benefit for re memory access reduction, we should act also act, uh, calculate the number of global memory accesses we need in order to load the input tile into the, uh, into the shared memory, right? So we only need to load the 12 elements. We need to load the 12 elements into the shared memory. So once we load the 12 elements into the shared memory, we no longer need to do any global memory accesses. So 40 memory accesses for the original code and 12 memory accesses for the tile code. So the, the, uh, the reduction of the bandwidth is 40 in the original case and 12 in the tile case. So we reduce the memory bandwidth by 3.3 times. That is the old code has 3.3 times more memory accesses than the new code. Okay, so the reduction factor is 3 times 3, 3.3. It's not quite five, okay? 
And uh, I'm going to come back to this point on Tuesday. Okay?